The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. The first presentation in our session this afternoon is offered by Michael Thomas, Kevin Kale, Kenneth Kazanis, Bruce Blair, Laurent Barcelo, and Anik Delagrav. And the presentation is going to be del delivered by Ashley Hossack. She is a student at the University of New Brunswick. She's a PhD candidate. She's a student of, with Dr. Michael Thomas. And she's doing her thesis on Portland limestone cement. So if I could ask, ask Ashley to come up, please. Okay. That's the point of, and you can advance your slides with those. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here. So, this afternoon, I'm going to be discussing the results of some field trials that were conducted with Portland cement and Portland limestone cement with SCM blends. So, first, what was the objective of this field study? As many of you heard this morning, in 2008, CSA allowed the use of up to 15% replacement of Portland cement with Portland limestone cement. However, Portland limestone cement is rarely used in Canada, despite the fact that the replacement of 15% of the cement with raw limestone can reduce the CO2 attributed with the cement by up to 10%. And up to now, extensive lab research has been conducted on the use of Portland limestone cements. However, it would be beneficial to have more field trials. So this project was conducted as a large-scale field trial to demonstrate the differences between Portland cement, Portland limestone cement with SCM blends. Now the three field trials that were conducted were conducted at three different Lafarge plants across Canada. Each of the field trials used Portland cement and Portland limestone cement with interground limestone. The first pour was at the Ready Mix Concrete Plant in Gatineau, Quebec, using cements made at the Lafarge plant in Bath, Ontario. This was cast in October of 2008. The following summer at the cement plant in Exshaw, Alberta, the second pour was cast. And then later that summer, the third and final pour at the Brookfield, Nova Scotia cement plant. These are just the locations of the three different pours across Canada. We have the Exshaw plant in southern Alberta, the Gatineau concrete plant in Quebec, and the Brookfield cement plant in central Nova Scotia. Now I'm going to briefly go through the different mix designs and some of the fresh concrete properties from each of the three different pours, starting with the Brookfield cement plant. Three different cements were used at this plant, Portland cement, a blended Portland cement with slag, and a blended limestone cement with limestone and slag, and three different fly ash replacement levels were used, 0, 15, and 20 percent. Each of the cements had 5 percent gypsum, and the limestone content was four in the Portland cement, 12 in the PLC slag blend, and there was no limestone used in the PC slag blend. The slag was interground here, and the water cementing material ratio of the mixes varied from 0.42 to 0.44, the slump from 60 to 80 millimeters, and the air content from 5.8 to 6.6 percent. One thing that's going to be important to note when I'm discussing the results is that field samples were only cast with the slag blended cements. The Portland cement mixes were just used for lab testing. This graph shows the decrease in clinker content for the three different cements, as well as the increasing SCM and limestone contents. You can see there is quite a range on the clinker content from 91% on the left side down to 48% on the low side with the PLC slag with 20% fly ash. Now I'm going to discuss the different concrete mixes that were used at the Gatineau site. Two different cements were used here, 
a GU with 3.5% limestone and a GUL with 12% limestone. Four different SCM replacement levels were used, 0 SCM, 25, 40, and 50%. One thing that was unique about this site was that the SCM used was a blend of a ratio of 1 to 2 fly ash to slag. For the, fresh, for the properties of the fresh concrete at this site, the water cementing materials ratio ranged from 0.44 to 0.45, slump from 75 to 100 millimeters, and air from 6 to 6.8 percent. As you can see, with the SCM replacement levels up to 50 percent, and limestone replacement of 12% at the Gatineau site, we're able to produce huge decreases in the clinker content down to 42% of the cementing material. Now for the different mixes that were used at the Exshaw cement plant. Two different cements were used at this site again. We used PC with 4% limestone and PLC with 12% limestone, and once again, four different SCM replacement levels, 0, 15, 25, and 30% fly ash. It's important to note that the x -Shaw plant was the only one that used only fly ash. The other two both used a combination of fly ash and slag. And at this site, the water cementing materials ratio ranged from 0.37 to 0.42. Once again, significant decreases in the clinker content were observed in these mixes. We only got up to a 30% fly ash replacement, so the clinker content didn't get as low at x -Shaw as it did at the other two sites. Now I'm going to go through some of the, re some of the three and four year results from these sites. I'll also be discussing some of the early age lab data. First we're going to go through the Brookfield site. At 28 days, very comparable compressive strengths were achieved for all six of the mixes. They only ranged from 32 to 37 MPA, with the PC slag without fly ash or limestone achieving the greatest strength and the same mix with 15% fly ash achieving the lowest. It appears that after three years, the limestone slag mixes reached slightly greater compressive strengths. However, the differences were very minimal, 2 to 3 MPA on average. Now I'm briefly going to skim through the carbonation results, because as you can see, the carbonation results show that we got negligible carbonation in the Brookfield samples. The plot on your right just shows the carbonation in contrast to a two inch cover. So as you can see, there's negligible carbonation relative to the two inches. Now for chloride permeability. Both of the, con both of the control samples after three years had moderate chloride permeability, both the PC slag with and without limestone. The, PL the PLC slag achieved slightly greater chloride permeability, and all of the mixes with fly ash got very low permeability after three years. Now for the field scaling results. The photos on the top are the GUB without limestone, and the photos on the bottom are the GUB with limestone. Fly ash increases from zero on your left to 20% on the right. And although it may appear that there's been some mild scaling in these pavements, you have to bear in mind that these pavements are on the road leading out of the cement plant, so they're subjected to constant heavy traffic over the past three years. And it's likely that much of the wear that we're seeing in these photos is due to abrasion more than salt scaling. However, you may note that the scaling appears to somewhat increase with fly ash content, and there's negligible difference between the GUB and the GULB at the same fly ash contents. Okay, now moving on to the results from the Gatineau cores. At 28 days, the GU and GUL strengths were nearly identical for all of the companion mixes with the greatest compressive strengths occurring in the 40% fly ash samples for both cements. After four years, the results are not as consistent. However, there doesn't seem to be a trending difference between the GU and the GUL cores. Now for carbonation. The Gatineau cores saw slightly more carbonation than the Brookfield samples. However, it's still minimal carbonation compared to a two inch cover, as you can see in the plot there. Now the chloride permeability of the Gatineau cores. The GUL control had slightly greater permeability than the GU control. However, once again, with the addition of fly ash, the permeability dropped with both GU and GUL with decreasing permeability as a function of increasing fly ash content. 
Once again, the field samples show no appreciable difference between the wear on the GU versus the GUL pavements at different SCM levels. Also, much like Brookfield, these pavements were placed at a ready mix plant, so there's significant wear is going to happen due to heavy traffic abrasion. The wear that you're seeing here is not purely from salt scaling. But you'll notice that there's little difference between the GU and GUL samples at the same SCM replacement levels. Now moving on to the results from the extra cores. There was slight variation in the 28-day strength. However, there was no significant trending difference between PLC versus PLC or between the different SDM replacement levels. After three years, the fly ash blends have all outperformed controls for both cements. The average difference in the PC fly ash versus the PLC fly ash for the same fly ash replacement level is less than 1% after three years. The extra pavements had slightly greater depths of carbonation than the other two sites. However, the maximum carbonation that we saw was still only 6 millimeters, which as you can see is very minimal compared to a 2 inch or greater cover. Much like the results from the other two field trials, the GUL control had slightly greater chloride permeability than the GU control, and they all dropped to very low permeability with the addition of as little as 15% fly ash. You can he see here that the effect of the 15% fly ash was much greater than the effect of the 12% limestone. Now just a couple of pictures here from the x field trials. On your left is the GU control, and on your right is the GUL with 30% fly ash. Both pavements show little to no wear at all after three years on the site. All right, up to now I've been telling you that the, photo, that the photos can't be attributed solely to freeze-thaw damage. So here's the results from the salt scaling lab test that we can attribute solely to freeze-thaw damage. You can see that in the extra ones, which was the GU and the GUL without slag, the GU saw slightly greater mass loss at most of them than the GUL, but the difference is minimal. And in the Brookfield samples, which contain slag, we got more mass loss in the GULB than we did in the GUB. And the scale here makes it look like it's a very significant difference, but the largest mass loss that we see here is only 285 grams per meter squared, which is still well below the 800 to 1,000 gram per meter squared that's generally our acceptable limit. Now, consistent differences were observed as a function of the SCM content in both PC and PLC. However, little to no difference was observed between the PC and PLC at the same SCM replacement levels. The compressive strength of all mixes were within 10 MPA of one another for concretes produced from cement from the same plant. The SCM blend concretes all had very low chloride permeability, and minimal carbonation and scaling was observed on all of the controls and SCM blends with both PC and PLC. So generally from this data, we can conclude that the PLC with 12% limestone achieved equal performance to the PC, and the effect of the SCMs did not depend on the limestone content of the concretes. Okay. Thank you very much.